welcome to Google. I'm a pleasure to be here in the flesh. I watch you guys online all the time. <laughs> really great show. It's slow, but you just never know where the plot's going. We have asked our employees what questions they have. I'm going to give you the first question. This is an anonymous question. So they ask the employee. You're not asking the employees. They are. No, the questions have asked the employees. <laughs> the employees have asked the questions. I'm simply So you've done nothing. You've I, done I nothing. do nothing. That's correct. You're just a titular figurehead. That All right. is correct. All right. So, so the anonymous question from Michael Jones goes like this. <laughs> that sounds like an anonymous name, actually. Um, I don't understand the title America Again, Rebecoming the Greatness that We Never Weren't. This is, of course, your new book, which right. is already the number one bestseller in the nation. Yes, yes. Thank right. you. America again suggests recre recreation. Rebecoming suggests recreation. The greatness we is clear. All of this is logical and fine, although obviously Yoda-esque. But then, case A, never were, was the impression that you were trying to create, would be a perfect conclusion. But you added the apostrophe and T. Taken, taken in toto, this would be a clever play on words, meaning once again becoming the country we hypothecate have built in myth or a fable. Is this not the title? Hmm. Case B, never weren't, which is what you chose. Which means, <laughs> I'm not done yet, Steve. I know, no, no, Keep, go on, go on, please. Okay, which means we never were not and thus never have been and thus the whole phrase is once again, once again becoming the country we have always been. This is strictly logical, which you cannot become, which you're not at present. What do you say to this? Well, criticism. I say to this, to Michael. This is the hardest and toughest criticism of your title that okay. I have ever seen. So Michael, Michael, Michael I Jones. Know. Michael, the fool says in his heart there is no God. But by God, he means that thing then which no greater thing can be conceived. But by conceiving of that thing, he automatically defines God as whatever he can greatest imagine. Therefore, God does exist because he has imagined that thing, which must be greater in reality than in his imagination. I completely agree. <laughs> All right. Those of you who are not familiar with St. Anselm's ontological argument, I'll boil it down for you again. Um, uh, America again, re-becoming the greatness we never weren't has to be written this way. Because clearly our country's in trouble, yes? Okay, okay, you can tell because I am the country and I'm all beaten up on the cover here. <laughs> we want to re-become the greatness, right? Yes. All right. <laughs> but if I said we never were, then that would mean America was never great, right? Yes. But if I said that we presently aren't, that would mean I am criticizing America which you mustn't ever do. <laughs> Therefore, it's America again, re-becoming the greatness we never weren't. Unless you've got something have... bad to say about America, Eric Schmidt. <laughs> do you have something bad to say about I, America? Because let America. me know, because I'm sure all these people and YouTube would love to know <laughs> what problem okay. you've got with the US of A, mister. Because uh, I don't, and I've proven it with a title that makes no sense. <laughs> I, but I thought you just convinced us that it did. Now I want to continue. The title, the title, the title is a peon to uh, all the uh, to the Republican convention, for instance. The Republican convention said America is great, and we mustn't listen to these people who criticize our country and do not think it's the greatest country in the world. And then in the next sentence, they would say we must re we we must return to greatness. They would say it sometimes in the same breath. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, American exceptionalism means the rules don't apply to us, and uh, but the feeling on the right is that we are losing the game of being a country, and so this was trying to capture both of those feelings. There's a there's a dichotomy, there's a cognitive dissonance that constantly exists on the right, and the, even more strongly now that we must return to a greatness that we presently have. Yes. <laughs> now I want to explore. Did anyone? Did, did anyone everyone recognize? Hold on. Did anyone recognize? I'm sorry, I'm stopping you in the middle of asking me a question, but it's Google, and there are no rules. <laughs> I've been told. I've been told I have to keep my pants on, but that's it. <laughs> and that he will enforce it strictly. <laughs> he will enforce it strictly. Did anyone recognize San Anselm's argument for the ontological existence of God? Yes, you did. 
move to the head of the class where you already are. He, he, actually, he actually used Google. Oh, is he? <laughs> You pretty much ran for president and ran, raised a super PAC and so forth. Yeah, I, had, I, I, I did absolutely have a super PAC, and, and I kind of ran for president. <laughs> I ran as much for president as I wanted to avoid violating federal law. OK, good answer. Good um, lawyer. <laughs> now, Jim DeMint has just announced. Jim DeMint, yes, yeah. Just announced Jim's a friend, but go ahead. <laughs> He's just announced that he's re retiring, and it occurs to me that you might want to. So you're from South Carolina originally, I think. I uh, yes, I am. You I'm, might I'm from South Carolina, to, the Palmetto State. You might want to run for Senate. Have you? No, I do not want to run for Senate. I want Haley, Nikki Haley, to just appoint me to Senate. <laughs> That's the great thing. People are asking me, "Are you going to run for Senate?" And I'm like, "No. Why would you run? She just gets to say it's you." <laughs> so, so yeah, so I would love. I'm, your... I'm honored by what you're implying so, so, and by the groundswell that I've felt. <laughs> but obviously that's something I have to take up with my family and, and my pastor Good. before I decide whether to take <laughs> that position. Is there another question, Senator? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think that Bill O'Reilly would be a better choice? He's not from South Carolina. <laughs> but I, 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 he's a I mean, very talented in, man and, I'm, and, I, and I sincerely admire his broadcasting abilities. But you know, but you're you're locked in a deathly battle with Bill right now. Yes. Oh, you mean over the, the book? Over the book, exactly. Bill Bill's got a book out called Killing Kennedy, and um, I I I admire his obsession with terrible things happening to presidents. <laughs> He's got killing Lincoln, uh, killing Kennedy, uh, sodomizing Coolidge. Oh, <laughs> that's a kid's book. Um, <laughs> And, and, and on, on, he was on John Stewart's show, and he said his next book's going to be called Killing Colbert. And it broke my character's heart so much to hear him say, hear Papa Bear say that. So we launched Operation Killing, Killing Kennedy, where I'm just telling my, my audience out there, I'm not telling you to buy my book. I don't want to abuse the relationship. But I'm just reminding them, if you're going to buy my book, and you are, if you're going to buy my book, just do it all in one week. So we can leapfrog at least so you know which, one of so one which, of his killing books. Which week do you want us to all buy your book? Right now, as right, we speak. Right just, now, yes, this week. Right now, go right now and go to a, 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 a local bookstore, a small My, bookstore, a big bookstore your, your online. Your book is on Google Play. What does that mean? It's, <laughs> it's our it's our online store. We're oh, gonna yeah. end up being yeah, your I know best. All about Google Play. <laughs> You're gonna end up being You're really gonna, yes. So go to Google Play. Absolutely. And what happens there? You're gonna people are gonna pay you lots of money to buy your book. Well, then it's a wonderful service. Excellent. <laughs> so you go there and you click and, on it. It's like going to like it's like that one that's named after a rainforest. You go to that one. Yes. And you click on it and you get it. Yes, it's the competitor to the rainforest. I don't. Good, and furthermore, because we got to preserve that rainforest. We got to stop. <laughs> Making books out of that rainforest. Do you get a physical book from you guys, or is it all the ebook thing? It's an ebook thing. It's only ebook. That's right. You can get a physical book too. We'll sell you, you one of those. Yeah. You will? Yeah, we'll get That's it nice. to, through your publisher. Good. At list price, no less. What? At, at less list, price? At list price. At list price. At list <laughs> price. So, the, so go, 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 go to Google Plus for no deal. <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing to pay list, which you should, because if you pay list price, they include more book. Understood. I'm not going to give any of this stuff away for free. I want to explore some of the origin, and, and I should not turn this into an Android commercial. Go ahead. And, and, <laughs> but Android is now five what, times now Android is the operating system that we that we got saw. it. Got it. All right. And no, Android Android is five times larger than the iPhone. I know. I know. So. <laughs> And Google Play no, runs I read on that someplace. So people will actually be reading your book on the most popular operating system. Then it's going to make my book better. Absolutely. OK. Which is why we support it. Great. Good. Let's try. <laughs> let's, I have a Google tablet. I have a Google yes. tablet. I have that little, that little that Google yeah. tablet. It's got kind of like that slightly pebbled finish and everything. It's phenomenally successful. Can I, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Can I have an external volume thing on it? Because yeah. you got to actually go into like a screen to do the volume of the external. That would cost extra. <laughs> Made of money. <laughs> OK. After this thing, after this thing. I, I want to explore the, the antecedent, the, the precedents that brought you to this view of American exceptionalism. And I want to understand 
why A Man for All Seasons is your most favorite book? Well, it's a play. But I enjoy, but the, the book form of it is actually one of my favorite things to read. The introduction to A Man for All Seasons, which is by Robert Bolton. If you've never seen it, it's the story of Sir Thomas More or St. Thomas yeah. More if you're a Catholic. And, uh, and I'm a Catholic. And uh, it's the story of the man who was a friend of the king, King Henry VIII, and he was made Chancellor of England. And Henry wanted to get rid of his wife, be done with Catherine and, and, and get Anne Boleyn in there. And Thomas uh, More wouldn't put his hand on a little black book, raise his hand and say, I agree with the king. He just stayed silent, wouldn't say anything. We saw and Henry in, chopped his head off. We saw this in the Tudors. Oh yeah, it's a little different in the play, but um, less um, less of this in um, <laughs> in the Robert Bolt version. Um, I really like it because it's the story. It's the story about um, essentially: is there any part of you, as Hen as Moore says, is there any part of you that is not your appetites? Is there any part of you that is not your fears and not your desires? In other words, is there any part of you that doesn't want or reject? Is there any part of you that is just you and from which you cannot retreat? Mm -hmm. And I really like, and when I, when I first started doing the show, I, I asked, especially the people who were at the, at the head, of my, head of my show, for instance, Alison Silverman, who was my original executive, no, she was my first head writer. Um, I said, I'd love you to read this essay because certainly during the Bush administration, there was no criticism of President Bush when he first started. Um, we tried to fix that, and yes, I'm going to come back to that. What? I'm going to come back. Okay. To that. So, and and there were so many people who were who were afraid to be be critical of the government at all because you be, could be called anti-American. And I loved the play because he he you know in this example he loves the king, uh, but can't agree with him in the same way that someone could love their country but not agree with them. And uh, can can you can you bring yourself to swim against the tide of all your fellows? Um, can you keep yourself um, with your own opinions and your own ethics and your own morals, regardless of the tide of the times? And it's, the Bush administration was a, was we all, so many people got swept in the wrong direction. I think. And what was interesting was that I was in the audience when you gave the uh, the speech right at the correspondence dinner. Oh, you were there. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You know, I have nothing else to do. Right. And um, I, so I was sitting there, and I was shocked that they were foolish enough to invite you. Because <laughs> you were so good. And I think that performance sort of put you from sort of a specialized sort of service to a truly national figure. That's my opinion. I think it literally changed the perception of you in society. So, so I went from boutique to chain store at that point, I guess. <laughs> it, it was like a step function. You know, it was not, it was, it was not. What's it was, a step function? <laughs> it's a step function. Okay. It's a big, a big jump. Oh, okay, it's a, sure. It's a mathematical term. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like, like the number line, like the number line, yeah. that kind of, is that it's what, what we mean do. by math? Yeah, yeah, it's what we do. Number uh, line, I got the number line. So, yeah. so it's like a really big discontinuous jump. Mm -hmm. And um, why do you think they invited you? Did they know what they were getting themselves into? Uh, <laughs> they're coming for me. <laughs> I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I did. I did peer through the blinds for a couple of weeks after that. After that show, um, I, you know, I got invited really early. The show started on October seventeenth, two thousand um, and five, <laughs> and. All right. So this building was used by the Port Authority to bring buses up and down. And those are the bus um, Lifts. elevators. So there's a truck about to come in and destroy us all. <laughs> That's the ba it's backing Good. up. That's the backing up. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here with you at the end, Eric <laughs> I, I thought the end was on December 21st. Oh, I, I, you probably, yeah. Probably, yeah, yeah, though I've, yeah, probably. No need to plan, no need to plan for anything on December 22nd in the Mayan calendar. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Getting me back to President Bush, who we've yes. conveniently forgotten. Well, I was invited by the Senator. press, actually. Ah. For the Correspondence Center, you were invited by whoever's the head of the, pre the White House press corps that year, and it was a guy named, I think it was Mark Smith, was a guy um, from the AP, I think. And he invited me, and we were only a few months into the show. We started in October 17, 2005, and it was January, I think, or early February when I got the invitation. And I said to my agent, uh, James Dixon, I said, let me call him back, let me, let me call him back. And I said, I think I want to do this, let me call him back. And I, got, I called John Stewart immediately, and I said, 
hey, John, I, you know, I got invited down to the correspondence dinner. What do you think? What do you think? And he goes, to like be a guest? What do you mean? <laughs> and I said, no, they want me to be the guy. And he goes, what? <laughs> have they ever seen your show? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask. <laughs> and I said, I think I kind of got to do it. And he goes, you got to do it. <laughs> and then we were really, you know, we were really worried. We were really worried that we wouldn't, we, I knew I'd never get this opportunity again. Like no one's, you know, no one's ever gonna ask me back. But, <laughs> but about a two weeks out, we started, you know, we started working on it about a month out. And the very first joke we wrote, very first joke we wrote for it was, um, People say that this administration is, is just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. That is wrong. They are not sinking, they are soaring. If anything, they're rearranging the deck chairs on the Hindenburg. <laughs> and, and to me, that was the spirit of the entire thing. Like, how positive could we be? <laughs> well, they knifed them. And the press, too, and the press, too, of course. Because people forget that half of it, like, we did 10 minutes on the administration and 10 minutes on the press. Yeah. And, but anyway, a couple, about, a, about, a, about three days before I went down there, we'd been working, like, we, we do 161 shows a year, and we pull very long, very long weeks, like as I was saying before, like 65, 70-hour weeks. And we were super tired. You guys know what that's like, I'm sure. And I go in, I get my coffee from a, a very nice uh, woman uh, who is from Algeria. And uh, I walked into her coffee shop right before I went down there, and she goes, oh, babies, you're so tired. What's wrong? And uh, this is my Algerian accent. And, <laughs> and, and I said, well, I, I told her what I was working on. She goes, you performing for the president? I said, yes. And he goes, he's going to be five feet away from me the whole time. And she said, but you are um, uh, a critic. You are a critic. And I said, yes, but I get to do my jokes just right at him. <laughs> And she leaned across, she's a little lady, very cute, and she leans across the counter and she took my chin in her hand and she said, it's a good country. And I said, yeah, it sure is. And I told that, I told that story to the president because there's a party before the correspondence dinner uh, that's really great. It's you, some cabinet members, heads of some, several press organizations, and, uh, and the president and my family was there. My mother loved President Bush. And he was, couldn't have been nicer to my mom. It was really a really charming party. And he, I told him that story, and and he goes, because uh, he goes, it's nice we can do this, and I and I told him the story, and he goes, only in America, <laughs> and it was a very positive kind of vibe that lasted for about another hour. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was a really but, fun but, night. But, but from that point, something happened in America. You and John Stewart actually became the major political. Operatives, whether you like it or not. No, I don't. Uh, well, because I'm me. a comedian, I'm not a political operative. I make jokes about the news. A lot of the news is about politics. That's not my fault. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I really don't. I really. If a political operative means that you have some game beyond what you're doing. Politics itself means I am not telling you my intention. I am showing you an action that is causing a reaction from you while I'm playing another chess piece over here. And together, I will. Tr I will triangulate some secretive way where I will achieve power over you. I mean, you know, you know, political action is class against class. I'm not trying to get power over anybody. That's why I don't like the idea of political actor in any way. I'm making jokes. I'm trying to make you laugh about something but that the, I care about, fact about something I care about. The fact of the matter is that the trusted organizations of our society have mm -hmm. been replaced by you and John. Bullshit. <laughs> And I'll Let's tell you why. No, no, Let's I'll tell you why. I'll tell you Am why. I right? Because if that was true, they would know. Come on. Come on. That's that's lovely. <laughs> that's lovely. But I know, but this, I've, people have asked me this before, and I don't think that's true because if people got, like, if that was the case, people wouldn't get my jokes. Because I'm not explaining that much to you. First of all, you have to know what I'm referencing to understand half of my joke. And two, I don't explain the news story that well to you. People come to me with knowledge. They might enjoy watching the show more than they enjoy watching straight news, but they had to have gotten news someplace but, but, else before they get to me, or else if, they wouldn't care. But independent of whether I'm right or you're right, the fact of the matter no, is... No, no, I'm right. <laughs> You know, it matters who's right, I think. It matters okay. who's right. Because this is what's wrong with news. They say, like, they say, you know, independent of who's right, let's talk about something. No, someone's right. Okay, let's I'm let's saying you're the problem, Eric Schmidt. That's what I just said. <laughs> let's, let, let's agree that there's an issue between you now and sort of the Washington establishment. 
because you have enormous reach. Right. So I got to be careful where I point this thing. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Because it's loaded. Wag the finger. Yeah. Wag the finger. Yeah. Wag exactly. The finger. Yeah. And so, do you think it's? Uh, do you think it's you and Washington sort of oil and water? What, what, do you, do you think? Ult how do you think it plays out? Man, they don't seem to like it when I go down there. <laughs> they're, not, they're never that thrilled when I show up. So I don't know if we're oil and water, but I, it's not my world. You know, I don't, I don't have any desire to have political power. I don't have any desire. You know, people thought John and I were doing that rally to be players and to, you know, what are they? What was it? we were accused of trying to actuate the youth vote? And to take, like, to, to drive people to the polls to win for the Democrats. And we've got this power. How will we exercise this political vote gun that we've got with a quarter of a million people on the mall and all this attention? And, you know, it just reminded me of, you know, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, as people sometimes know. And there's a great moment in the Lord of the Rings where, you know, if there's somebody here who doesn't know the plot, they got a ring, they're trying to destroy it to, to, kill, to get rid of Sauron. Some people, I mean, listen, 10 years ago, people were going, oh, yeah, what's the story about? And, oh, no, no, this is important. Um, <laughs> There's a meeting right before, you know, you know, there's a meeting toward the end of it. Gandalf says to everybody here, everybody in the meeting, it's Aragorn and some other people, and he goes, listen, our only hope, our only hope for Frodo and Sam to succeed is that Sauron cannot imagine anyone would want to destroy the ring. He can't imagine we don't want this power. And I, I thought, when people kept on saying, what's their intention with this rally? It's like, we're just Frodo and Sam. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Washington is Mordor. <laughs> we're trying to throw the ring. So, <laughs> we're trying to throw the ring of divisiveness into so, the fires so, of Mount Maul. So, so why, why can't we just sort of fly the Great Eagles into? Why can't they just fly Frodo into Mordor and throw the ring in? Yeah. And solve this problem. Uh, because he would be. They'd see. They'd see him coming, and and the Nazgul have flying steeds. <laughs> I don't think DC has any Nazgul's. Oh, 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 you're back to the metaphor. <laughs> I thought you were talking about something important, the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, why don't we continue? What do, you think, what do you think of my little metaphor there? I think your metaphor is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You're a very smart man. <laughs> I, I want to continue. Um, mm. We got a, thanks to you, we got a great like uh, shot of uh, the mall with all the people on yeah, it. Yeah. You, got, you helped us out with that, yeah, we that, like that. that map image. Yeah, Beautiful. absolutely. Google Maps are phenomenal. Yeah. Ask an Apple user. <laughs> uh, the, um, let's try, <laughs> I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna ask, now things are going really well. In here. this interview right now? No, <laughs> no, in, in, in Google, right? And I wanted to ask for the benefit of our, of our employees, Tell us more about the Colbert Platinum. Colbert Platinum? Yes. Well, Colbert Platinum is a, it's a, it's a rare opportunity to upgrade your membership to the nation. OK. You get all the, all, it's actually, it upgrades your citizenship in the United States. OK. Gets you into all the finest things that I can't even tell you about because you're not in the Platinum yet. You know how rich people have better things than other people? OK. Like that. Okay. How, yeah. does, how do these me pr prospective members join? Working for Google is a good start. <laughs> um, the, pla the, platinum is a, the platinum is actually a piece we do on the show, Colbert Platinum, about the platinum lifestyle. About um, Now, you tell everyone to turn off their televisions and listen. If you're not a member, if you're not a platinum member of the nation, this is not for you. So we tell them to go off and, you know, uh, go, re you know go drink their store brand sodas and come back to us later. <laughs> Um, which is good for them, I understand, it's good for them. They just need the carbonation. Um, uh, but we stopped doing Colbert Platinum, actually, because the economy got so bad that we actually felt it bumming out the audience. So for a while, we changed it from like, you know, starting 2009, we stopped doing Colbert Platinum because it really was bumming out people. And also, uh, they're like, high-end things were being bought, like personal submarines and stuff like that. So we changed it for a while, we changed it to Colbert Aluminum. <laughs> And, and then now we just don't do it at all. We'll, we'll relaunch it again sometime. I, I cannot wait. Now, are you going to do, are you, are you going to have like a whole year of Hobbit stories? 
No, we did a week. We did I know a, you did a week. We did a week. We did a week of it, and I kind of, I kind of, I kind of maxed out, and we got to, we got to come back. We got to leave Middle Earth and come back to America okay. in the new year. And so, in this doctrine of American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. right, which is, I think, what the book is actually about. It is about that's the first chapter is the thesis statement: American exceptionalism. Rules don't apply to us. Okay. So, if that's true, how does America become great if the rules don't apply to us? By the book. <laughs> Every chapter uh, tells us how to return to what we already know is the right thing, is to reject socialism, reject collectivism, um, um, and go with the gut. Uh, we even have a chapter just on food. <laughs> Why America is the crispest, crunchiest, most corn-fed nation on earth. <laughs> and if you are what you eat, then we are all, just stick a, you know, put a stick up our butt and we're all corn dogs walking around. <laughs> In preparing for this book, did you study the amendments to the Constitution, and did you have any opinions about the amendments? I, I always have opinions about the amendments to the Constitution. I mean, everybody's got their top, like what their top ten. Amendments Do you have like are. a top one you like? Oh, my number one, my, my my number one would probably be the Second Amendment, and this because and this my number two would probably be the First Amendment, <laughs> and then probably my third would be the Seventh. My fourth would be the tenth, fifth. <laughs> We've been ninth, sixth would be the eighth. Is everybody writing this down? Yeah, okay. get this down because I don't have a rationale behind it. <laughs> so I won't remember. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to think some more about the amendments, what they stand for. American exceptionalism. Sure. I have nothing more to say, Eric Schmidt. <laughs> no, but there's nothing about the Constitution in the book. But but the book allows this book to the Constitution allows this book to be it's free speech. Well, sure, no, no, no. Yeah, well, well the Constitution. Second, the Second Amendment. Second, uh, the second, second. The Second, second Amendment prayers. allows this book to exist. The first because if anybody stopped, the, no, no, the Second Amendment. Because if anybody <laughs> stopped me from publishing this book, I would shoot them in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand me? You understand me? Are we clear? <laughs> That's very, very clear. It does. The Second Amendment guarantees all other liberties. <laughs> I think it's time to start getting some questions from our audience. Oh, that'd be great. Who would like to ask a question? We have a microphone right here, and we have a microphone right over here. I like these moments of silence, you know? I've got one for you. I'm curious to know, when's the last time you had to audition for something? And how did it go? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the first time I didn't have to audition for something was for Law and Order, Criminal Intent. I actually remember that. I played a um, forger who lives with his mother, who's sort of a psycho who kills people through the mail with lie bombs. And uh, I didn't have to audition because they said, we wrote it with you in mind. <laughs> nice uh, it's, it's been a while. I mean, I, boy, I, I paid my dues, though. I, I, I auditioned for a long, I, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I just have auditioned for movies, I guess, but I just, I've been doing my show for seven years. I don't think I've auditioned for anything since I've done my show because I don't have time to hypothetically do something. Do you know what I mean? I either have to do my show or if you'd like me to do something, I can try to make time for it if it still sounds like it's gonna be fun or challenging or something like that, but seven years, eight years, something like that. Yeah, I don't mind auditioning. <laughs> I, re I really don't, because if I was on the other side, I would definitely wanna know whether the guy could do it. You know, I don't wanna hire somebody because they're famous. You know, right. or really handsome. Yes. <laughs> Do we have a question over here? Um, meanwhile, I'll ask you: um, How do you think Google can become the greatness that we never weren't? <laughs> well, it kind of already is because it. And I'm not trying to blow secondhand smoke up your butt. I'm. <laughs> It, 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 Google can be anything you want it to be because you just it, it is it's a reflection of your own desire. It's a porthole to, toward what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. and unless you guys are putting some restrictors or some you know on on the information that I think I'm getting, 
than it is anything we want it to be because it, it's 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 an it's an actuator or it's it's a it's a it's a pathway to what we want rather than the thing we want itself. Do mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it, it's it's the finger that allows us to look at the moon. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I, we'll do you know what I mean? That. You know what we, I mean? We, like, we'll don't look at my finger. We, okay, we, you'll we, miss out on all that. Everyone understood that's the strategic inevitable. Go yes. ahead. Hi. Uh, this was a few years ago, but. What actually happened between you and the Venture Brothers guys? Is there bad blood there, or was there miscommunication? No, I can't do my show. I can't do my show and do that. That's I, had, I also had to quit Harvey Birdman too. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't do my show That's and cool. and do the voiceovers because I think both shows, uh, and I, I think the Venture Brothers is great, and I I loved doing Harvey Birdman, but I they had to wait for me too much. Do you know what I mean? I eventually mm -hmm. couldn't do any of it anymore. And I love when when I had to quit Harvey Birdman, I played a guy named. Phil Ken Seven and a guy named Reducto, and Phil Ken Seven would say things like, ha ha, bubbly parts. And I, when both of them died on one show, they were both hit by a bus on the same corner at different parts of the same cartoon by the same bus. And if you freeze the frame at the moment that I get hit, my characters get hit, on the side of the bus it says, watch the Colbert Report, 1130s <laughs> on Comedy Central. But those are both, no, there's no bad blood. I think they're both great. Cool, thanks. We have some employees have submitted questions online. Um, here's one that I'm not quite sure how to interpret, so I'll just read it to you. Sure. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck? <laughs> or one duck-sized duck horse. horses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred duck-sized horses, I would say. A okay. hundred duck-sized horses. You heard it here first. That's a clear answer. That's a clear answer. Did I win? <laughs> is there a right answer there? I'm sure there is. And How I'm about sure. you? What would you rather do? I would pick the opposite. You would? A horse-sized duck? <laughs> Are you insane? <laughs> I mean, it's not a sharp beak, but one blow. <laughs> the thing has got to weigh like 1,200 pounds. Whereas duck-sized horses, you could... You could just snap their spines as they came at you. What I don't understand is why are we fighting them? They're both... Wait a second, I know why I'm right. I know why I'm right, because horses are vegetarian and ducks are carnivores. The duck would come at you and the horses essentially would leave you alone unless your pockets were filled with hay. Which they are not. Which they are not, as far as we know. Okay, that's a very clear answer. Yes, ma'am. Can you recall a time that you were struck speechless? Yes, several, but the one that leaps to mind immediately was when I had Jane Fonda on the show. And without preamble, she got up, sat on my lap, and stuck her tongue in my ear. <laughs> and I was rigid, I didn't know what to do. And I felt like, if anyone was old enough to remember Johnny Carson, there was the famous time where a spider monkey crawled on top of his head. He was having like a, you know, Jack Hanna on and a spider monkey jumped on his head. And I thought, Jane Fonda is my spider monkey. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to do with myself. Googlers have continued to suggest important questions as a follow-up to the duck versus horse debate. Oh, really? Yes, here's the next one. As a follow-up? Yes. From my answer on a piece of paper, they're literally, yeah. Google's that good that they're actually transmitting onto a piece of paper right now? We, we really are. We, Why are you withholding that technology from the rest of us? We, we really are. You that's, wow. What are your plans for welcoming the royal baby? <laughs> this is the question, I'm sorry. Any suggestions on what the baby should be named? I mean, Stephen Colbert's got a nice ring to it, obviously. <laughs> Charles Philip Arthur George. George Philip Arthur Charles. Arthur Philip Charles George. All four? All, any one of those. In whatever order? Sure, sure. It, there's an infinite number of four names. There are, well. Yeah, two whatever. To the four, two to 16 the or something, two to the four, what is it? Four times something three like times that, two, whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, Again, we, the number line. The number line. That's what I liked when I was a kid. No matter what class you were in, whether you were in so, like first grade or if you were in calculus, the book starts with the number line. First page is, let's remind ourselves what well, integers another are. Another Googler has asked. I was in the middle of a sentence. Just okay. 
<laughs> Another Googler has you asked. You people have to put up with this. I'm so sorry. Power mad is what I would describe you. A, the Googlers have asked, how would you efficiently determine if a tree is balanced? What is the runtime of your algorithm? <laughs> For your benefit, if a tree, tree is balanced, if a tree, a tree is balanced, if you can um, hang <laughs> ornaments on any part of it. Mm -hmm. That's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, what is the difference between Stephen Colbert, the person, and Stephen Colbert, the character, and what were the challenges in you becoming Stephen Colbert, the character? Um, there are a lot of differences, I hope, between me <laughs> and my character. I mean, there's some things, uh, there's some things we have in common. Um, we're both from South Carolina. <laughs> we're both fan, uh, fans of Tolkien's work. Though I tried to keep that separate at first. I tried to like, keep that membrane at first. I was like, no, 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 I don't want, that's too important to me. I don't want him to have that. But, the, but there were too many opportunities for me to wax about it. So I, I went ahead and let that membrane be you know, uh, permeable. Um, but uh, we're both like super Catholics. He, he, he thinks he's like Captain Catholic. I still go to church. And I happen to know I'm, I'm a fairly, you know, I'm not particularly pious or, or devout Catholic, um, though I still go. Um, uh, he's a, he's a well-intentioned, poorly informed, high-status idiot. <laughs> and, and I'd like to think I'm well-intentioned. I'm better informed than he is. He is completely incurious about the world. He is, he, he is living an unexamined life, and that's fine with him. Um, uh, he's high status. I really enjoy being low status. I really enjoy playing a weak character. That's why I really enjoy him, is that he is this unbelievably self-important character. In fact, when I, Jim Fenhagen, who designed like the Republican set this year, and he like, does the Olympics, he's a huge set designer, and he's a wonderful guy, an old friend of mine. I said to him when he was designing my first set, I said, I want your inspiration to be Da Vinci's Last Supper. <laughs> I said, because if you look at Da Vinci's Last Supper, the whole, the, Christ has no halo. Existence, all of creation is his halo because there are all these converging lines in the room and in reality that converge upon Christ's head as, as all of, you know, as the world is God's footstool, as it says in Matthew, the world is, is Christ's halo. And so I said, I want my whole set to be like a halo around me. So if you look at my original set, there are these convergent lines that come in my set and we painted it on the floor so I could be, I am the rising sun. You know, there are no television monitors behind me. I'm not like, you know, what Brian Williams or even John said. He's got like television monitors behind him and he's conveying the news to you. He's a conduit. I am the news. I am a dawn into my own day. And, and, but I, but that's the, that's the outward status of the character, but his weakness and his incuriousness and his thin skinned quality weakens in such wonderful ways. And I love, I love that weakness because I think that's the reality of me. I think I'm actually, I, I'm I'm a f I'm I'm not as I'm not as as well defined as he is, and I enjoy um, copping to that in my own behavior. The what's interesting about the, the, I think there is union in the, your character and you personally are very you're very supportive of the troops, and I remember in, when you were in Iraq, right? You got the president to order you to get a haircut. <laughs> yeah, pretty serious. That was fun. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and we I knew I wanted to have my hair head shaved. Because I thought, oh, that'll be that feel good in the room, you know? That'll feel good with all the troops. And I said, who could shave my head? The general. general well, who's general. gonna make the general do it? The president. <laughs> and everybody said yes. It was really lovely. But is, is there? And I think the support that you're doing with with the troops is fantastic. It, it, was there some reason in sort of growing up or something that you felt that way, or is it just you're just a genuine patriot about this stuff? Um, I don't know about you know. I'm a general pa genuine patriot. I, I love my country, and I think patriotism does not require focus on the troops. Do you know what I mean? There are other ways to be patriotic other than association with the military. Um, that being said, I think not enough attention is paid to the men and women who make the sacrifices that we have collectively decided they should make and then ignore. Yes. Do you know what I mean? We, I we're all responsible. We all, are, we all are sending the troop orders. Do you know what I mean? And we did it without a lot of thought, but with a lot of emotion 10, 11 years ago and not a lot of discussion. And then we thought our job was done. And so because I talk about it a lot, or used to talk about it more when it was more in the consciousness, especially in the news consciousness, because I'm, my, my show is a shadow of the actual news. 
and I'm in some ways very reactive that way. Um, I've I've felt at a certain point that I I had a responsibility, uh, along with my responsibility to be funny, to take opportunities that came to me to talk about the troops when I can. I, early on, I have a 86 Airborne, sorry, 82nd Airborne um, flag in my office because very early on in the show. Um, a young man and his wife came, and she had to speak for him because he was he had such brain bad brain damage, and uh, he still he still could hear, but he couldn't really con converse. And he enjoyed the show, and he gave me the flag, and all he could really get out was, "Don't forget us. Yeah, please keep talking about us." So I've got it on my wall, and I think about it, and we don't nearly do enough, and we don't no, help sure. as much as we don't help as much as we should, but certainly when you have an opportunity uh, that fits within, the, I still have a responsibility to do a comedy show. When I can fit those two things together, we're we're um, more than happy to try to make it happen. And and as I said, we, we should do more. Well, we still have a hundred thousand troops in Afghanistan. Right, you know, you know, right. I mean, we went to Iraq, and I'd, I'd love to be able to do something in Afghanistan too. And sadly, I think I might have the time to. Yeah, go ahead. So a few years back, you suffered a terrible work-related work injury at your wrist. So my question to you is: Do you plan to expand to other body parts? Because you know, like ankles, legs. Anything, anything that shatters, I will call attention to. Thank you. Anything that happens to me, that's the nice thing about the character, and one of the things that saves me when there's downtime in the news, is that anything I think is worth talking about is news. That's the character can name it. You know, anything that happens to me is the most important thing that's happening right now. And when I broke my wrist, sad to say, the first thing I thought of is content. <laughs> So, and, and I have a follow-up question. How is your auditioning of Eric Schmidt going right now? And do you plan on taking Eric on your book tour? <laughs> <laughs> He's doing very well. Thank He's you. Doing very well. Um, do you have an up-tempo or a ballad? Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I really can't stay. <laughs> Baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> Okay, Thank go you. ahead. Hit it. I, I learned how to. I learned. I learned how to dance with. I learned how to dance with Cy. That was enough. You did? Yes. Wow. I was really bad. He's so the he's. He? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. He's the number one cultural phenomenon. I was eight. And if it's popular, million. it must be good. Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of which, again, many Googlers have been asking questions about your upcoming YouTube show. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> I, I think, have an upcoming YouTube yes, show? Yes, we have all decided that you have to have a YouTube show of some kind. Okay, it, does that violate my contract with Viacom to have that? Because you guys had a billion dollar lawsuit against each other, you realize? You actually, and Sumner Redstone would rather see your head on a you stick. Actually asked us to, you actually asked us on television to give you the money. You forget. Oh, no, I don't forget. You never gave it to me. I know, I know. If we, you gave the money, we I'd be knee deep in we, hookers and blow and I'd forget. <laughs> No, no. You know, I was deposed. I was deposed I know for that you lawsuit. Were. I know you were. And I've got a good story if you'd stop talking. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was your question? Tell your story. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so it's been a few years. I don't think I'm violating it. So I was. I, I got deposed for the YouTube uh, Google thing, uh, the Viacom thing, because boy, they were mad at you guys. <laughs> they were so mad at you guys. And so Yarl's lawyer brought me in to say, well, how isn't YouTube great? And wouldn't you not have a show if it wasn't for YouTube? And all those kind of questions. And the, the lawyer for Google would read me statements that I said on air. And I said, well, I didn't say that. <laughs> and, and, and he goes, no, you said it. You said it on this broadcast. I said, no, my character said that. <laughs> and my character's not under oath right now. <laughs> and they said, well, if your character were here. <laughs> What would he say? <laughs> and so I would say, OK, well, uh, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If you ask me questions that my character has to answer as opposed to me, I'll move my coffee cup to the other side of <laughs> my place here. And then you'll know I'm speaking as my character. And so if they'd ask me a question, I'd keep my cup over here. And then in the middle of the question, I'd start moving it over <laughs> to the side. Because I realized they were asking me something from my character. And, he would, and the person would go, let the ref record reflect that the coffee cup is now on the left side of Mr. Colbert. <laughs> you have a question. That's it. And my character's answer was always like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I don't know what you're talking about, buddy. 
<laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I was just wondering if you have anything left on your career wish list. Sure. I never, I just don't know, I, I never know what's going to happen, you know, even tomorrow. I just got to spend the week with, you know, some of my favorite creative artists with The Hobbit, you know. It was unbelievable. What a workshop made me my own Hobbit feet, you know. <laughs> Next week I get to sing with all these wonderful artists, you know, doing Christmas carols. I've done my own Christmas special. I've had a, 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 a rally on the mall. I've testified before Congress. I've, I may or may not appear in The Hobbit. Um, <laughs> I, I, get, I get to, the nice thing about my show, and whether or not I do the show forever, I mean, everything ends, but whether or not I do the show forever, the nice thing about my show is that as the host and executive producer, I get to ask of myself anything I want to try. And, 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 but that also means I have to do everything I know. And so it's just this tremendous sort of refreshing gift, as tiring as the show sort of is, because I am kind of decaying before your eyes. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's in, in the same way, it's also rejuvenating, because I'm I, it, the show is only what I want it to be. I can always say no to myself or, or ask myself something new. But beyond this, I just want to work with people I like. I love the people I work with. I love what we do. And I just want to be able to do it with joy. And the moment I can't do that, I have got to stop and try to do something else. Um, there are times when you've, you've taken your persona outside of the show itself, like when you ran for president or started your super PAC. And I was just I was curious, um, how did you get the idea to do that? Or why did you decide to start taking the character outside of the show itself? Well, he thinks he belongs everywhere. Okay. You know what I mean? He thinks he belongs everywhere. So did he make the decision, or did you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, that sounds like one of those Google... My ego is just big enough that I'd like to think I'm in the driver's seat. <laughs> but I'm that not sounds like one of, those, sure. one of those Google lawyer questions. Are you a Google lawyer? No, I'm, I'm an engineer. Ah, even worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> very precise. <laughs> I like, do, I like doing, I like uh, putting him in situations, because he be thinks he belongs everywhere, anywhere he goes, as long as we can um, prepare for the situation. I, I rarely take him, like I do talk shows like right now, or if I go on Dave, or I do any news talk shows or anything like that, or, or book, even the book tour, any place I would do it, I'm only myself. I could lapse into him, or what, the way he might behave at times. But out of context, he clangs against the world. And I have to be prepared for that clang. And so I'm very prepared for the Correspondence Center. We're very prepared for the rally in the mall. I'm very prepared to go to Iraq. I'm very prepared to test before, testify before Congress. I'm very prepared to give you know, a testimony uh, any place, so get, appear before the, the FEC, or give a speech on, you know, to supporters on the streets of Washington, DC. As a lot of preparation goes into that. And I like it because I like changing the context of a space. I like changing the context of a supposedly not performance space into a performance space and to see, um, well, here, that's what I like to do. Here's what I like to do. I like to think of the character as a pebble that I can throw into the news and then report on my own ripples. <laughs> because, you know, John Stewart, and I've said this before, but John Stewart has characterized what he does as like sitting at the back of America's classroom and shooting spitballs. I am the spitball. <laughs> and I like to shoot myself into it and see what it looks like when I'm in a news story. For instance, you know, appointed senator of South Carolina. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't intend that. And usually the best ones I didn't actuate. They were, they, I didn't push. They were, they were invitations. I didn't say I want to testify before Congress. They asked me. And I said, you know, this is going to be a terrible idea. <laughs> and they said, we want you to come anyway. And I said, all right. Um, in the same way, yesterday I was just walking around, nothing happening. And like suddenly I, there was a horse underneath me. And it was me being senator from South Carolina. And I thought, how delightful, how delightful <laughs> that we've planted all these seeds of you know, political activism in my home state. And it is a reasonable, ridiculous thing to surmise that I might get the job. <laughs> But, but, but when, I, when you put yourself in the story, and I put this character, this very false character, into a story, anything that looks like me in that story is probably bullshit. And that's a specific way of doing satire. It's satire by comparison, rather than satire by deconstruction, if you can understand the difference yeah, there. I'm you. falsely constructing the satire as opposed to deconstructing other people's behavior. The, uh, 
two more questions. I have a question. I've really enjoyed this before we get to this. It's been lovely. You haven't heard the last two questions. <laughs> now, I'm concerned about end of year timing. End of year uh, timing. End of year timing, because we've got next week, sorry, this week is the week we need to buy this book en masse, globally, everyone. Yeah, this is, this is the first week that you need the to do The first it. week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> then we have December 21st, which is the end of the world, which is the Mayan calendar date. Yeah, do we know how that's happening? Uh, <laughs> You'll have to do some research on Google on this. And perhaps we can look it up while we're chatting. And then we have the fiscal cliff, which Washington is obsessed about. Mm -hmm. So do you have any comments on the fiscal cliff and its timing after oh, your God. book and oh, after God. the Mayan end? I'd rather the world come to an end than talk about marginal tax rates. <laughs> yeah. We've got. We've got a pretty darn good fiscal cliff script. Our first time, when he came back from, from Thanksgiving, was the first show, I think that first show after Thanksgiving was the first show that I thought, oh, this is the first show after the election. Because after the election, up to Thanksgiving, you're just sweeping up shrapnel from the election. <laughs> Emotional and sort of political shrapnel from it. And then the first show back, we knew the fiscal cliff was a big thing. We did a piece, it was a perfectly fine first act piece. We had a guest, we had Rand Salam on the show to talk about um, Republicans capitulating to taxes. And, and right after that, we wrote another really nice fiscal cliff piece that I keep waiting to be out of date. But the ball just won't move that much. I mean, Obama can submit his thing. The Republicans can submit their thing. But the story is still the same. The story is about you go first, you go first. You, well, one you know, side could try to hide from the other. What did you say? One side could try to hide from the other. And then someone has to yell, Ali, Ali, oxen free? Yes? <laughs> That's right. So no, we, I'm actually so avoiding talking about the fiscal cliff that I actually did a week on The Hobbit. We'll have you have the honor of the last question. Uh oh, do you need a writer in that case? I guess that's what I should ask. Um, why, why did comedy kind of become your thing? Do you think, or did comedy kind of pick you? Well, that's that's a nice way of putting it. That's a nice way of putting it. I would say the the, you know, I, I can't under uh, uh, emphasize how important comedy's been. Uh, to my life and how important certain, you know, opportunities that came along to my life and they all, many of them seem sort of accidental. For instance, like Second City. I never thought of myself, I didn't think I was going to be a comedian. I had a sort of secret desire as a high schooler to be a comedian. I didn't know what that meant. You know, I didn't know, I just really liked being funny. I'm from one of 11 kids and we're a funny family and being funny is important. Like the, the king of the room was whoever was funniest, you know. And uh, I remember as a child, you know, I, Seeing comedy helped my, my family had a, a tragedy when I was younger. My father and two of my brothers died. And oh, I remember my sister making another one of my sisters laugh so hard on the way on the, the, the car away from the cemetery. One of my sisters made the other sister laugh so hard that she fell on the floor of uh, the limo, one of those big floors like with a rumble seat facing each other. And she fell on the floor laughing. And I remember thinking, I, I want to do that. And I don't know whether it was specifically in the context of dealing with tragedy, because I don't think I was always only 10. I didn't, but I remember specifically thinking, oh, I, I want that. I'd love to have been able to do that right now. And then I fell asleep every night for years listening to Bill Cosby, Wonderfulness, Very Funny Fellow, um, uh, David Fry, Richard Nixon, A Fantasy, um, George Carlin, Class Clown, Let's Get Small, Wild and Crazy Guy. And I would just, uh, back when you could stack albums, so many, stack so many of them, the top one kind of played slow as it went around. And, and then I went to college to be an actor, but an actor, actor. I wore black and I had a beard and, you know, I was like, let me share my misery with you, you know, <laughs> poet slash jerk kind of actor. And then I accidentally met some people from Second City and, and took some classes there and got invited to audition and accidentally, just sort of the happy accident, fell in with some great people. And I still would, I quit Second City four times in order to go do straight black box avant-garde kind of theater in Chicago, which is that's what I was going to be. I was going to live in a studio apartment with no furniture and a futon on the floor that I stuffed myself with yak fur and <laughs> just drained, single and with a beard and, you know, sandals and a tashiki. And I was going to, you know, drink from a samovar that was constantly bubbling in the background. And 
And but then one day I was backstage. I kept on returning to doing comedy, and I was backstage one one night. And this is really the thing that made the decision for me. I was backstage with a guy named Dave Rosowski, who does a, a, a does does a. a, 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 a What's it called? A, 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 a web. He does a what's a blog? What's a audio? It does a podcast. It's a great podcast. Yeah. <laughs> what do you kids do? Your podcasts. Um, it's a great guy. We're backstage. Somebody was on stage, and they were supposed to do a very simple blackout. And a blackout is a very short. It's got one joke, and then the lights go out. This is Second City. It's a pacekeeper for the show. She goes out there, and the blackout is this. She goes, you know. Um, you're supposed to say, I like to do a song for you now. Welcome to the, you know, the No Exit Cafe. I like to do a song for you right now. A song for the whales. And then she you just make a thing of you tune up your guitar for a long time. This is a song for the whales. And then you go, <laughs> it's very simple. You do whistling clicks and everything. It's fine. Not a big, not a great laugh, but it works every time. She goes out there to do it. I like I like to do a song for you right now. I like to do a song for you right now. She just goes into her whistling and her clicking, and we're backstage waiting to go on for the next scene, me and Dave, and we said, "What's well, not getting any laughs? What's, this is foolproof. No laughs at all. What's going on? Something's wrong." And then she goes, "Oh, I forgot. It's song for whales." <laughs> and we burst into laughter backstage, and we threw our arms around each other in the agony of her failure. <laughs> and we're just laughing. We fell like a, like, a, like a collapsing teepee. We just fell to the ground, and Dave's feet went out onto stage like this as we held each other like lovers. <laughs> the most intimate, joyful experience at her pain that we all knew, and she could hear it happen, and the audience could see our feet, and she started laughing at how wonderfully she had just failed. And, and I thought at that moment, this is what I want. If, if failure of this scale can cause this much joy for anyone, then this is the healthiest thing that I could do with the rest of my life, and I will do nothing else. And I've never looked back from that moment. <laughs> so, so, St so Stephen, I, I think what you what you see is that to that it really takes a brilliant man to produce this character. And I, what I like about this is we get a sense of who you really are, and we get some extra special, too. Well, it's nice of you to say. And thank you very much for coming to Google. Now, we've got 30,000, 40,000 employees. So I should sign all of them? <laughs> Let's just review what they have to do. This book needs to be the number one bestseller this week. Yes. And every week thereafter. Uh, well, one week will do, and we'll see what happens. Until my book comes out anyway. <laughs> Right? So our instructions yeah. are? Go get the book. Buy the book. Buy the, don't even read it. <laughs> that doesn't matter to me. I just, well, I, have actually, to I, I just have to leapfrog one of O'Reilly's bestsellers. I, I actually read it, and it's phenomenal. You are so perceptive. <laughs> There's a reason why you're I didn't it. quite get the 3D glasses thing, and so I didn't put them on right. But aside from that, you, it's a great book. You didn't put 3D glasses on, right? No, I didn't. You, you could run Google, but you don't understand 3D glasses technology. <laughs> we have much better glasses technology at Google. I understand. Stephen Colbert, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.